in the darkest worlds that ever were. The only thing that brings light are stories. Those stories are kept in one place. The tiny bookcase. <laughs> Hello, explorers of the Sacred Library. I'm Ben. I'm Nico, and you're listening to The Tiny Bookcase. We have a returning guest for this special Halloween episode. You may remember her from an excellent tale she told in Season 2 for the prompt Family Recipe. She's also the creator and executive producer of the Nightlight podcast and a horror writer. We would like to welcome, for the second time, Tonya Ransom. Hello, Tonya. Hello. Thank you guys so much for having me back. That's quite all right. We were we were threatening to do it last time, so we <laughs> like to follow through on threats, otherwise people won't fear us. Exactly. You should always follow through on your threats. <laughs> I think we just needed an expert on the truly spooky, and you are <laughs> the only person we know who's cool enough to actually tell horror stories. So <laughs> I think that is that is so. Your um your podcast, the Nightlight Podcast, is really cool. Um, Thank you. I'm a big. I, I think a jingle goes a long way to defining a. At how a podcast is going to get under your skin and the guitar riff that you guys have got on that is fantastic i listened to Thank the most you. recent one and it my was son really... actually played that really yeah oh that's that's fantastic yeah it's really cool yeah he was taking guitar lessons at the time and you know he told his guitar instructor he's like hey my mom's starting a podcast like do you know a creepy song that you know i could play and you know we weren't really thinking about it for a theme song he just wanted to like you know kind of celebrate me starting something so he was proud of me and um, oh. so his guitar instructor taught him that little riff and yeah, we played it and recorded it and I put like some other little sound effects behind it and that's how it came to be. Always wholesome and horrifying every time you're here. How do you manage <laughs> how do you walk this bloody tightrope? Very, very carefully. <laughs> yeah, we just um we just beat ours out of a friend of ours who's a uh, who does sort of music for um games and creates games and stuff. Uh, he's a lovely guy, uh, Ian. He was on the uh, in the first season. If anybody wants to go and check that out, but uh, not quite as wholesome as your story, I'm afraid. It's unfortunate. So, it's a particularly uh, spooky night because uh, we were, were going to record earlier with you, and you got knocked out by a storm, didn't you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which uh, which is is fairly um, foreboding. Um, I have to say, I'm a little bit worried about this episode because I'm not scary in um, <laughs> horror writing. No, and we're I've just flat a, outing ourselves, aren't we? Oh, yeah, basically, because apparently I can't write horror or comedy. <laughs> 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 At least that's what I tell myself in my head whilst I'm trying to do it. Um, I think so. that's probably not true. I do think horror and comedy are the toughest kinds of writing to do though because it relies so much on like pacing and timing and you don't necessarily have that in other genres but i think you're lying i think you're actually really good at it well, we'll see. <laughs> um, i know that i know that nico's very good at uh, comedy writing so maybe his horror writing will uh will follow suit we'll balance that um, out by being absolute dog shit yeah you're right <laughs> <laughs> well we were going to what we've done is got a professional horror writer on to really yeah. Like, prove to people that we're crap. <laughs> we played quite a safe game last time. We only had each other on the Halloween episode. We didn't bring a guest in. So there yeah. was no real... We might have both been shit, but then comparatively, it was like, yeah, they're fine. So now <laughs> this is the next one. This is the one. Oh, after, after I wrote the story for that Halloween episode, the last time we did one, I, I read something from Stephen King where he was, like, categorising the levels of horror. And I realised that my story was in his like lowest, easiest category. <laughs> it was, so it okay, was... everyone has to start somewhere. Yeah, true, true. Oh, Stephen King, I live for his approval. Apparently, <laughs> well, I think it's probably Please time Daddy to King. to get <laughs> Daddy King, <laughs> King Daddy, King Daddy. <laughs> Um, let's uh, let's have some stories then. Uh, fortunately for me, uh, Nico's going to be going first, which means that he's not going to look as much of a fool as I am later. <laughs> um, I feel like you yeah. guys are setting the bar really high, and now I'm like, oh, I don't know. Like, <laughs> kind of scared to read my story now. <laughs> 
Well, the prompt is A Day in the Sun, and it's uh, been picked by our guest, Tonya Ransom. Take it away, Nick. A Day in the Sun. I remember when they erected the first booth, but barely. I, I can't have been more than four at the time. The euthanasia debate had been a point of contention for so long. But after everything that had happened in the 20s, it was determined that each soul was entitled to end their life. It started with the sick, of course. They'd visit one of the booths. New York was the first one. And there, they had a chance to drift away comfortably. It was medicinal then. Families would go together. Their elderly and enfeebled would be held, sung to, and then sat delicately. The doors closed, and after a few moments they were gone. The soundproofing came some time later. Too many were disturbed by the screaming. The last moments before the bodies were discharged into one of the underground furnaces to provide light to the city were often ugly. Better than living in pain for years, accruing medical debt, everybody agreed, but still distasteful. Even once the walls had been thickened, the knowledge that those inside could be in pain was deemed inhumane by their loved ones. Of course, those that had always disagreed with the process claimed it was no more inhumane than murdering a relative. The debate threatened to spill into its infancy one more. But instead, an idea was born. It was Dr. Fiola Abebe who had pioneered the concept, inspired by some of the toxic animals native to her home. Delirium. The booth would with her new system, be able to recreate sensations. Sexual euphoria, the rush of exhilaration from a skydive, even the, the joy and fear blend of riding a roller coaster. It was lauded as one of the greatest scientific achievements of all time, a way to tap into the human mind and make it feel... anything. It's much better to imagine Grandpa ejaculating in the booth and screaming in pain. Right? The technology was privatised at first, of course, but after a few years those patterns leaked and then the cheap booths started appearing. The ones that were less clinical. They became popular with the suicidal. You know, once they were springing up on every street corner, it felt like death was being actively encouraged. In truth, the world was crowded. The livable portions of it anyway. So many unable to work. Unable to eat. Death seemed an easy solution to an insurmountable problem. After all, if not this, then it would just be something worse, wouldn't it? Choking on your own blood because you couldn't afford chemotherapy. Wasting to nothing in an alleyway because your next meal was just too many steps away. Better to feel something, anything other than the bleak reality you inhabited, even for just a moment before death. Almost anyone could experience the euphoria engine, but the pattern for the good deaths, well, that was more tightly protected. I mean, even if they could have copied it, there's no way the cheap booths would have been springing for the cocktail of chemicals that they designed to stop your heart or your brain. In truth, I never really knew the science behind any of it. Instead, these booths would have systems rigged up to end you when the experience you selected peaked. A lot of the time, it was just a snub-nosed gun built into the front of the headset. When the timer goes, click. You decorate the back wall of the booth. They never clean the things either. A cursory spray from the built-in systems, but no one coming and fine-tooth combing the thing. But then I suppose by the time you're putting your head into that harness, what do you care if there are fragments of skull in the creases of the chair's leather? So of course the industry booms. 
And then the rich, not that I've ever met anyone from the upper cities, became obsessed with the simulations. Want to experience enough heroin to kill a man while a lower city girl blows you? Fuck it, you got the cash, have the experience. So the market for the things grows. And then it starts to get weird. The pleasure and excitement cause had been common up to this point. But now the rich wanted to feel darker things. And of course, once it was written for one of them, it would get pirated, and some version of it would find its way into a cheap booth. Rich people feeling what it's like to be crushed by a boa constrictor, or as close an approximation as the extincted subgroup zoologists could explain. Or how it feels to be flayed. It was the height of perversion. Unless, of course, you lived up there, and then it was nothing but class. If your life has no pain, then fuck it, why not create your own? I bet my life they had ways to feel what it was like to be us. To starve. To be stabbed to death because you had something to eat. There'd been booths for 25 years when I decided I couldn't take any more. My husband had died. He was always soft and gentle. But we'd needed to be hard that winter. I don't imagine there's anything in the booths that compares to losing someone you love that much. I don't care how broken you are. No one could possibly want to feel that. To feel half of yourself destroyed. To miss the stupidest things. The sound of breathing through their nose, the irritating way they pronounce certain words. I had to sell his body to the power company. I, I couldn't ever have afforded a funeral. That was his final gift to me. A week of food. But I couldn't live without him. So I went to a booth. We'd walked past that one so many times. He always squeezed my hand when we did. I think he knew I had a storm in my head. And the thunder was always rumbling. And he could be the lightning rod and keep the storm from destroying the landscape. Well, now he was gone. And I was drowning in the floodwaters. The booth was awful inside. Like a grey coffin. It was marked here and there with the faded brown stains of the depressed. I scrolled through the options for a long time of what I could feel before my death. Clinical names and others clearly the work of the upsellers. Perfect body hottie makes you come triple X perfect ass. No thank you. Extreme slow motion car crash, real glass feeling supercar explosion. I'm not even sure what a supercar is. And then I saw it. A day in the sun. The first one that sounded even remotely pleasant. Maybe it was clever enough that I'd be able to feel him there with me. A park somewhere, perhaps. With real sunbeams on us. I chose it before the urge to die could pass. The file was only ten seconds long. Incredible, really, how much they could fit into that time. Human mind really is capable of some insane shit. I tried not to think about the fact I just set a countdown on my own death. That's what I want after all. And I get one day with him before it's gone. But I was wrong. I was so... So, so wrong. You see, the heat registers first. And I thought my eyes were closed. But really it was the whiteness around me that tricks me. And then the heat is gone. And it's replaced with something else. 
In reality, I would have been obliterated instantly. But their program, their evil moment of agony was designed to prolong the sensation. I could feel it as my nerves bubbled and fused, as my bones became ash. I could taste my own roasted tongue. I tried to weep and my tears became steam and they melted the lenses of my eyes. And I felt madness then. Dead and alive all at once. Time, a broken concept. Because I knew I had ten seconds to live. But my mind had felt a day. Hours and hours and hours of searing, devastating agony. And then a sound cut through my pain. The slam of a gun's hammer smashing into the place and... Nothing. The gun had misfired. Jammed. The whole mechanism of these cheap pieces of shit relies on your body slumping back. Your weight beginning the process that would deposit you into the furnace. And without my fall, the system began to loop. Ten seconds at a time. Each an unbearable twenty-four hours of torture. By my count, it's been six months so far. I can hear the sun's words now. It mocks me. It's prisoner. They don't ever clean these. It was fucking bleak, man. <laughs> it was. I loved it. <laughs> yeah. Like, it was the build to it as well. You know, really made a lot of sense while the guy's in the booth and then the description of the death was enough for me. You know, it's like, oh, this is very sad. And then you've got an excellent short story twist in the end there, which worked beautifully. I agree. I'm kind of like scared to follow up oh. with something else. Like you did a really good job. I think it was not good. technically a horror story and that's how I got I, away with it. It was I, a sad I, I, <laughs> I, I was going to sort of go into that because you had, um, it's, it's a science fiction story really, isn't it? Um, yeah. But so yeah, as 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 our uh, as our horror horror expert on you, like where where would you identify like the horror genre in in Nick's story? Nick's story? story. Okay, so this might be kind of a weird answer. It's gonna feel like a non-answer, but I think that horror is a very subjective thing, and different things scare different people. So, like, for me, for a story to be labeled horror is not necessarily, like, was it scary for me at any point? It's, was there, like, an overwhelming sense of dread throughout the story? And I think that like, there's definitely a sense of dread. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Throughout, throughout the story. So, like, for me, like, that's that's what makes it a horror story is, like, this the slow descent into this is getting worse and worse and things are being revealed that are, you know, more awful. And for me, that's what, that's what makes it a horror story. Like, yes, it's got, you know, science fiction elements, but you know, you can have multiple genres. So I think this is a science fiction story story told as a horror story. Mm. I, uh, I, I, I like that. I, I think it did. It was just filled with dread. This, uh... yeah. This idea of a society where the bodies are burned to light the cities is um... <laughs> pretty bleak. It's very Black Mirror-ish. Like I was thinking yeah. that the whole time I was yeah. listening. Uh, so this could totally be an episode of Black Mirror. Say and... that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a that's a great couple. It? <laughs> it's true though. Yeah, yeah. The, this idea of a suicide booth, like, so this isn't actually the first time that I've come across this this year. Um, oh, I, I, w was this? Was this? Did you read? Did you read something else, and this inspired you to this, or did you? Come up, I know. I know the suicide booths in like Futurama, for example. But like, is there any other, any other sources or anything like that that you you drew on for that? 
Well, it, it started because I wanted to write what it would be like to spend a day inside the sun. In the sun, yeah. And the only way I could think of to justify that was, but what if a VR? And I was like, ah, oh, no, that's well, bullshit for horror. They have to really feel it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I really like the way that you approach the prompt, actually. Like that's That being the way that somebody does that, and then it loops because the gun misfires. Fantastic. Really loved it. Yeah. I I thought there was um you were referencing a little bit um Alan Moore's Providence. Um which is I've not read his it. right. So, yeah, so I'm not familiar with it either. Right. So it's his um Cthulian horror prequel to the Neonomicon. Yes. That he also wrote. Um and it's about a uh a homosexual um uh, journalist and author. And the the central turn of it is around a suicide booth in the middle of a park somewhere um and they do stuff like like play some of the music to the people and you know it's an experience going in there and having that done to you and the people can hear the music outside the booth and they know something's happening and so like i was i was immediately in because i was just like oh shit this is a this is a modern like this is a more because that's set in the 20s or whatever yeah. so this was this is 100 years later this is different technology really cool stuff um, but that was, uh, in terms of things to be like evoking for me, th that this story evoked Providence is also high praise, I would say, because that was it's a really cool touch in your story, and you've done nice. it in a really unique way. Nice to know I share a zeitgeist with the ultimate weed wizard. That's <laughs> hey man, that weed wizard is bright when it comes to telling stories. I'll tell you that. Oh, he good. He good. Oh, oh, he good. Um, the. Uh... The only other thing that I noticed as well, uh, not the only other thing that I noticed, but the, the other cool uh, possible reference that I noticed was to J.G. Ballard's Crash. With the, yes, uh, yeah, uh, I that like that. That was a reference uh, to that. I like, yeah, yeah, because <laughs> that story is fucked up. If anyone has <laughs> read Crash, you need to go and read Crash. Cause... I have not read this. I'm like no. disappointed in myself. Hold on. <laughs> if you if you like uh, paragraph long descriptions of people ejaculating the moment their car crashes, then you are going to enjoy this this story. It's about people that have like um, it's called like autophilia or something, or like there's a version of autophilia that's to do with crashes. Uh huh. Um, and so they deliberately find themselves getting into fender benders in order to get off and stuff. And it's a wow. It's a, yeah, it's it's very fucked up <laughs> cool that you yeah and jg ballard is just a so, so so for me the two things this story reminded me of were sci-fi as in jg ballard's basically a sci-fi author although he did some main stuff as well and then also alan moore which is more the horror angle of it so mm. i i i liked it as a as a sci-fi horror for sure or science think... fiction horror yeah losing sure. your mind in that way does have a sort of cosmic horror element to it doesn't it I think so. The, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think any story with, like, dystopian elements is almost automatically horror um, as well. I think uh, normally that sort of dystopia is often, like, a uh, overarching, like, cultural dread or, or societal dread. And then people have to inhabit a space inside that. But this does a really good job of making the dread quite personal. Um, with the way that he had to sell his husband's body for food mm -hmm. and and these kind of things and and walking past the booth every day and getting that little hand squeeze until the hand squeeze that the other hand wasn't there anymore a really lovely and well told story uh i say lovely i mean uh, <laughs> it was uh, bleak and hard hitting but uh, Most beautifully told definitely. I'm going to remember the way you said lovely about the man. <laughs> you know, That's I'm just going to say, like, episode. you definitely have a more bleak story than I do. So, like, I'm impressed. Well, well, how about you show us? <laughs> Put your bleakness where your mouth is. Uh, I will be happy to. <laughs> Put your bleak in your beak. <laughs> cut that out. Me. Future me. Cut that out. <laughs> Future Ben, remind future Nick not to cut that out. Yeah, definitely keep Scuffle. it. Come on. <laughs> All right. Legend has it that when a drop of blood touches the surface of the lake, a monster devours it immediately. That's not true. 
that little bit of blood isn't enough to draw any attention. A drop is nothing more than a waste of precious energy. But a warm body? That will get swallowed whole almost immediately. No modern human has ever seen what ate their companions and lived to tell about it. But plenty of people have watched their friends tumble overboard and disappear into the abyss. And many so-called friends have been the reason someone has met their end in the lake. Case in point. About a hundred years ago, a family of four set out in a rowboat for a pleasant picnic on the small island in the middle of the lake. The children, both young teens, fought as most siblings do. Name-calling, insults, insincere death wishes. The father's powerful baritone failed to control them. The mother's shrill screams did nothing more than act as a dinner bell. The fight escalated until it became physical, the younger boy attempting to push his older sister into the water. But she was quick. She grabbed hold of his shirt. They both lost their balance, and then lost their lives. A desperately needed meal to the starving. You see, the people native to the area had been massacred by these picnicking colonizers a decade before. Before their demise, they'd sacrificed a member of their tribe, usually a criminal of some sort, every equinox. This was sufficient to round off a diet of fish and the occasional bear that wandered too far into the water. But fish didn't provide enough sustenance. Before the sacrifices, fishermen regularly didn't return home. When the natives finally saw something curious and large in the water one day, they put two and two together and realized they could choose who they would lose to the lake. For centuries, all lived in harmony, a meal each equinox, as well as the occasional treat when a member of the tribe made a horrible enough transgression. Good fortune was bestowed upon the tribe. Their crops and hunting ventures were always successful, no matter how neighboring clans fared. It was a highly successful symbiotic relationship. Then the colonizers came. They didn't believe the natives' nonsense about the great spirit in the lake. They didn't believe it existed, and they didn't believe it required regular meals. To them, the natives were savages with primitive beliefs. They were simple-minded and deserved the benevolence and religion the colonizers had come to bless them with. When the natives resisted, they were killed. In a single night, the tribe was gone. No one remembers them now save what they called Lake Dweller. And no one remembers a day when something below the surface wasn't hunting for its next meal. No one remembers seeing a majestic creature swimming freely in the sun, without fear of being hunted. Not a soul knows of the years a starving creature suffered in the lake, hovering near death, eating every living thing in the water. No one knows why there are no fish in the lake anymore, only that there are none. Sometimes a foolish traveler refuses to believe there are no fish and attempts to prove their fishing prowess, only to have their boat mysteriously capsize, their bodies never found. But a few days ago, a man decided to camp on the bank of the lake. This, in and of itself, was not unusual. Lots of people do this every year and return home in one piece. But this man had heard the tales of mysterious disappearances in the lake, and read the stories of those who watched someone else succumb to the depths, despite being reportedly strong swimmers. While no one had actually seen an unknown creature in at least a century, it was well known that something in the lake was at least opportunistic, if not outright sinister, and this man was set on finding out what that something was, with a camera crew in tow. And if anyone could find the monster in the lake, it would be this man, he was famous for documenting the existence of creatures long lost to time, though most skeptics believed he faked his evidence. But he didn't realize how dangerous this mission was. He didn't realize his would-be prey was tired of the dark depths of the lake, longing to live near the surface and bask in the sun, to cultivate another mutually beneficial relationship. The native's lake dweller refused to hide any longer. A life in the dark, scavenging for food instead of being worshipped, was no life at all. And so when the man's boat cut its way across the lake, I swam alongside it and plucked the celebrity from his perch on the bow in full view of the camera. My existence will be televised, and I will either have more food than I can eat, or I will suffer the same fate as the natives. I am not a monster. I am a god. I really like that that uh, point of view almost shift at the end. Yeah, that, uh, that's that's really cool. It's because it sounds like an omniscient director uh, uh, narrator, 
but it's actually a, a god. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, therefore, it is omniscient, which is a really cool touch. Yeah, um, it was tough to get that right. Um, you know, like I had to reword stuff a lot throughout. So it could be that, well, you yeah. know, and a narrator was speaking, but, you know, really all along it was the god speaking. Worth the effort, cool. I'd say, because it's Definitely. seamless. And, and it's a very Thank clever you. mechanic as well. Like it's a good tool used well um, inside in a, a, a evocative story that's got a lot going on in it. So I think that's really, really good. Um, this idea of having um, like blending. So I was thinking about a day in the sun as you know, and you, you've kind of gone for the approach of like someone's 15 minutes of fame, um, mm -hmm. which is one of the ways that I was thinking about approaching it. Um, and I actually just couldn't really think of a good way to do that. Uh, that was horrifying in any way. And this is brilliant. This is exactly what I would have liked to have written if I'd have gone down a route similar to it. So I, I think that's already a, a really epic thing that you've done there. Thank you. Um, the um, the sort of like post-colonial tone of it as well, I think is is um, is really good. Uh, I, I I really enjoy seeing that in literature um, a lot. Um, the, what, I think the the, what the phrase was uh, these picnicking colonizers or something like that. It was yeah. It, it was it was good. Just these sort of dismiss these like nonsense people that have ruined and ruined the land and lost the knowledge. Yeah, it, um, it's really nice. And it's, go ahead, Nico. I, I I really enjoy the the mythology made real aspect of it. It's mm. especially you know as we get later into the story and say you know these people who they don't remember why there are no fish because this myth has passed into legend. And then it being reinforced as being, no, no, this thing is real. You guys can forget as much as you want, but it's there. I'm here. I'm still here. Just, uh, yeah, I'm yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's the I'm here that makes it go from, yeah. oh. Yeah. To, ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, yeah. like, so I kind of came at this, like, I wasn't expecting to write a story about that, but um, I had just gone camping right before I wrote this story. And, um... I have this thing where I like reading historical markers. And so um, as my boyfriend and I were driving home, um, you know, anytime we see one of those historical marker signs, like it has a number on it. And so whoever's not driving will look up and see what it was. And there was a historical marker about um, this guy who had settled in Texas and had successfully defended um, his encampment from the natives. Um, and, but I can't remember exactly the way it was worded, but I remember like listening to it and thinking like, this is exactly why we have such a problem with racism in this country because, you know, they framed it as this guy that came here to take other people's homes from them. He was the hero of the story. You know, he was defending, um, you know, his people and his encampment, but really he was the invader <laughs> and, and, sure. you know, the reality of it. Um that's and, you know, like I said, I wasn't intending to write anything like that. It's just like that's ended up like I don't plan things before I write them. I just kind of write them and see where it goes. And that's where it ended up ended up going. And that's that's the indeed that that's the the postcolonial examination that you've successfully done in the story, I think, is like just reframing the story to closer to what actually happened from a dispassionate point of view. Yeah. Um, which is which is really good. I mean, we um, this idea of having historical markers on the side of the road that you can look up is is actually really cool. We we don't have that in the UK. Oh There's really? I'm not aware of no. Um, yeah, it's I actually like, pretty I like cool. It. Yeah, well, <laughs> it'd also be a historical marker every ten feet or something, which would yeah, not be particularly useful. But uh... and none of them would belong to us. <laughs> 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 just things other cultures left here or we took from the yeah. only ones that didn't invade yeah. <laughs> well, i mean technically that's what most of our historical markers are you just wouldn't know it by the way that they word things on them what's well, this uh this previous idea of like to the victor goes the spoils and the victor writes writes the story mm -hmm. yeah, history is written by the winners yeah exactly yep. but uh it, it's it's always interesting to re-examine it from a more general human perspective than uh, like a nationalized perspective, for sure. I'd argue even better from this inhuman perspective. It, well, yeah, yeah, that's really cool. I I can't go over that tool actually. I think it was 
because the actual horror of that story for me was the bit where it climbs up off the page into your face as oh i've been reading i've been or, or in this case listening to a uh a, a, like a I was going to say a swamp god, but it's not a swamp, is it? It's a lake god, mm -hmm. uh, a lake god talking, and it's it's really like a uh moment. That just worked <laughs> so well, um, I think that was really good. I, I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. It's, it's really got me got my wheels spinning, which is which is always a good sign, I think. Awesome. Yeah. Then my work here is done. Yes. <laughs> Don't go spinning on that lake, Ben. You'll mysteriously disappear. <laughs> Uh, speaking of like mysterious lakes, there is a lake here in the United States called Lake Lanier that was built on a town. Um, it was a black town that um, they basically flooded to, you know, they, they did, they wanted to put a dam up. And so they flooded this town and like legend has it that, you know, if you go swimming in the lake, then something will, you know, grab you and drown you in the lake. Oh, I, I mean, obviously oh. it's it's super disgusting that people have done that to other people isn't it? Like, <laughs> yeah. directing a river to fuck over a village or a town is just ridiculous but also that is a like really horrible image isn't it of like things grabbing you because of a um a misdeed in the past of the of a yeah culture. Oh. The first bit of fucking seaweed that touched your leg. You were <laughs> right. so See, quick. I'm just not gonna go in there at all. Like I'm yeah. about that life. No, I don't want to do that. Tell people that story once they're already in the lake, I think, and see how fast they get out. Yeah. It's all fun in video games when you go underwater and see ghosts of the past because it's a useful <laughs> right. framing device. If it fucking happened to you, <laughs> <laughs> just have a heart attack and sink <laughs> oh. Oh. well right well i guess i'd better see us out with the third we'll story go on, then. indeed <laughs> a day in the sun it doesn't like the sun so i sit in my yard from dawn until the glare dips below the western skyline Furloughed at the start of the pandemic and redundant by the end, I haven't worked in a year. Instead of friends, the chirping insects in the sandy scrub keep me company through the day. High factor sunblock only lasts a few minutes in the Arizona sun. Sometimes it's easier to burn than reapply it constantly. The skin that bubbles up does so over mottled bruises painted in the colours of a nebula. The tanning of my hide toughens the puckered marks where my collagen vainly attempts to keep me watertight. I do sometimes leave, but I can't be gone long or be out late. It will get worse if I'm not there. My chapped forehead and scalded hands draw looks in the store, but the clerks are more concerned with other customers having meltdowns about masks than the quiet burned guy buying tinned spaghetti and sauce and light bulbs. Everything takes time, though, and I don't have much of that. I wait for the checkout, distance from any socialisation, as the woman at the head of the line aggressively debates state law with the security guard. I watch the sun dipping through the branded storefront glass and check my watch to estimate the time before it sets. I have to run home, hoping the plastic bags won't split on the jolts. The shadows on my porch are already growing as I fumble the key into the lock. Inside, the lights are on. I leave them on all day. The collection of lamps hanging bulbs and sconces I have filled my home with, flicker with weak electric light. Though the rooms are bright, I can feel it in the shadows as I make my evening meal. It wants me nearby, and it wants to hurt me. The slop is tasteless. I can't smell or taste anything. Some of the bulbs have died, and so I move through the quiet of my house, replacing them with fear-quickened hands. The bedroom is the brightest room. Ringing the double bed are lamps of varying sizes and shapes, I leave them all on as I climb into bed. The sheets pull across the bubbled up burns from the sun, and I know that some will ooze as I sleep, yellowing my bedding. I wake in the night, and the darkness grips me. My sheets have been pulled from me, and the lamps are out. In the slight moonlight, I can see the stain where she had been. That pit in the mattress next to me had been burned there by her rot. And as I stare at the empty space, I can again hear her breath catching. The fear rises in me and jumps me from the bed. 
My shins knock over a lamp in the darkness, and I step down hard onto the filament and shards of a broken bulb. I feel it pull at me, and I pitch forwards into our dresser. The corner of it gashes my forehead, and I lie for a moment where I fall. Stunned and bloody, I half crawl, half stumble from the room. The lights are out everywhere, and the fuse box is downstairs. I feel it wrap my legs as I try to hobble down the carpeted steps. The world tumbles around me until I crumple at the bottom. My arm has folded under me in the wrong direction. The coldness of the pain spreads from my belly to my brain. I can see the fuse box now, and I crawl closer. Behind me, the darkness gathers around my legs. Looking back, I see depressions on my flesh forming as its bite closes on the back of my ankle. I keep crawling using my one good arm, as it isolates the tendon and wrenches it, long and useless. I don't have screams anymore, but sweat fountains over me. Stretching, I reach up and open the cover of the box. By feel more than sight, I run my fingers on the line of switches and reset the ones that have tripped. The lights hum into life once more, and I see it pull away from me, retreating to the corners where the minimal shadows hang. My breathing becomes desperate as I feel myself going into shock. I lie for some time as my mind spins out behind my open eyes. I do not know how long it takes me to muster the will to carry on. I raid the medical closet I keep stocked, and begin the work of patching myself. Painkillers, stitches, and a sling. A bad night, even for us. My small first aid talents exhausted, I sit at my kitchen table in the bright and empty house, until dawn begins to touch the windows. I look around and see the small shadows in which it persists, undulating, writhing slowly like a pit of snakes. I don't know how long I can live like this. At least for today, I can stand and limp into my yard to spend another day in the sun. What the f fuck was that? <laughs> God, don't... I've got a thing about the dark, right? I, I think I told I told the so, least fucked up story out of all of us. We went super extra because you were coming, I think. You did. I love it. I love it. The uh of everything in that, the idea of letting your skin bubble in the sunlight was the worst thing in that. Right, yeah, like I felt that. <laughs> Truly horrific. Yeah. The uh, yeah. I, so it's I in my head it's set in, in Yuma, Arizona, which I think is the hottest town in America from what I, from my research, uh, and apparently apparently they get uh sixty six percent sun, like clear clear heavy sun, year round, which is enormous. <laughs> nah, nah, you're all right. Yeah, yeah. The um, so I'm trying to decide. If this thing, this stalking darkness, is in their mind or not, and mm. is that up to us? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it is sort of up to the up to the reader there, uh, and this person is is clearly not well. No. Um, and we we get very much get it from it is written from their perspective, so that's entirely entirely there, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I think you can take from that what what you'd like to take from it. Um, but uh, there was this feeling that um, there's you know there's going to be a, a theoretically I think a few people writing about in setting stories inside uh, about the pandemic, sorry. And I kind of yeah. wanted to write something that was just using it as a time frame rather than the point of yeah. the story. Um. So yeah, yeah. I, I I had a bit of fun writing it. I also really struggled what to initially when it's at least when I got started, right in the first person present. Um, yeah, I that's find tough. That hard. Yeah, it's very tough. I find myself slipping yeah. back into you know past tense a lot. So much. Um. And uh, yeah, that was that was the, the main. Uh, edit. Those were the main edits that I was doing on the way back. I'd sort of find one and be like, "Ah, I got you, you little bastard." <laughs> I, I, I looked across the room. No, I look across the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Every time. 
the uh, the casual slipping in of the the stain from his dead wife. By the way, just just lobbing that in there. <laughs> I see you. I see you, Ben. <laughs> you think? Get to yep. mind, yeah. I'm not. You're not the only one with a dead spouse, Nicholas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but mine didn't have the uh, the line about an old man ejaculating, so I think you win. It, that's Listen, definitely the best line out of all, all the of stories. My, <laughs> all of my stories have Jack being old men in them. It's just whether or not they're lead characters. <laughs> just, you shouldn't have started a podcast. You should have gone to therapy. <laughs> this is... Are you not my therapist? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Who have I been playing? <laughs> authors from around the world to give you therapy once a week. <laughs> Are you uh, my mummy? <laughs> <laughs> That's so fucked up. <laughs> oh no. Oh. Yeah. So I, I was sort of wondering, like, because I actually quite like it when, um, because it, obviously it's nice being like, you know, what you liked and what you didn't like, but like in terms of like feedback, in terms, in terms of like like how the first person worked, like, d- did it work there? Or was it? Was it? Were there times where it didn't work? I think it had to be in first person. The yeah. story you told, because right. if you'd had that from an outside perspective, it's like uh, Joker, the Joaquin Phoenix Joker, mm. where you don't know it's through his eyes, but the majority of the movie is seen through his lens. Yeah, and it's what makes it effective. Because things are slightly warped and distorted to match his worldview. And that's what made it scary. Because he was scared, you were scared with him. Mm -hmm. And it makes the fear personal. And that makes it work. Yeah. I think like using first person present narratives is a great way of making it easier to get in your character's shoes and feel some of the horror that they're feeling. Um, like, honestly, like, I feel like, I don't know if this is actually true, but I feel like there's a trend in horror going toward more first person present narratives. And I think it's for that reason is it allows you to kind of be more in that moment and you feel more tension and more dread because you're feeling, um, your feelings are more in line with what the character is going through versus if it was spoken about like as a past sort of event. Yes, it's lets... more, more immediate, isn't it? Yeah. yeah it, lets... it, it Not only are you feeling what they feel in kind of real time, it means that you, in that moment, are afraid of what they're afraid of, not what you are. Yeah. So you can read things that wouldn't frighten you, but because you are absorbed in that character, it does frighten you. So it's, yeah. it's almost like cheating. <laughs> That was that was sort of what it felt like whilst I was writing it. That it it felt like it's it's like a shortcut to putting your reader behind the eyes of the main character. Um, but you know whether that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like theoretically, taking out steps is is a good way to get meaning and story across. So we write flash fiction. You got to take out steps always. Yeah, yeah. That's the other thing. This is um. This is just shy of 900 words, which is uh, very short for me on this podcast. Most of my stories end up around 1,500. Um, and it very much felt like I was cutting cutting through everything else by writing in this style. Yeah. Um, even so, I think there's probably bits that can be trimmed down and stuff. But it was a fun writing exercise, and it was, it was really interesting um, trying to do horror. Um, whether I succeeded or not, I don't know, but... Um, it was, it was did certainly you, fun. Did you find that you wrote in a character voice naturally, or you had to get into a headspace for the guy you were writing as? Um, because that's the bit I always find yeah. tricky at first. Yeah, no, I, I think this character voice is is very similar to my own. Uh, yeah, my own outlook and my own way of thinking and doing things. Except obviously, he's spun out after the death of his wife during the pandemic um so i didn't have to step too far there like i think the story possibly could have benefited if i'd have put myself more in somebody else's shoes um then again perhaps not i don't know Hmm. 
Yeah. I think it was a very good story. I thoroughly enjoyed it, man. Yeah. Cool. Right. Well, I, I think uh, I'll, I'll take that. Um, it's uh, it's always nice when it uh, when it hits him. I think those are those are three three good stories. I think we've had. They're all very different as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's something I always worry about. Like I worried about last time. It's like, what if I write a story that's like super similar to one of yours? You know. But yeah, we were like completely different interpretations, which I think is awesome. It'll happen one so, day. Yeah, it'll happen one day. We'll we'll write exactly the same story. Right. Like, <laughs> and, and then we're gonna have a Stephen King horror on our hands because that's the weird shit. Yeah, right. That's, that's the stuff that he likes. He classifies that like uncanny horror as uh, what was the example was. Um, if you come home and you realize that all of your things have been replaced by exact replicas. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I was like, damn it, son, in an interview, you can write better than me. <laughs> uh, he's, he's a talented fellow. I wonder if the cocaine I've... helps. Uh, almost certainly. I've got a question for you, Ben. For me? Is it... Yeah. For you. <laughs> Specifically you. Because it's going to lead on to a question for Tonya, so play along. Okay. All right. <laughs> is, is, it, my play face on. is it terribly gauche that we, an English podcast, are doing a Halloween episode? Yeah, sort of. Um, the uh, as as attested by, so we had a, we had a lot of um, British listeners in the first in the first uh, season. And the Halloween episode was the worst episode that we put out in terms of numbers in the first season, wasn't it? Because I don't think people really do Halloween in, in the UK in the same way they do in the US. No, but as we went more yeah, international, it's numbers caught up, didn't they? The, the numbers caught up as we went more international. Exactly, yeah. But um, are, you, are you a Halloween-y person, Tonya? I know oh, yeah, absolutely. Horror, but... <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I pretty much celebrate Halloween year-round. Um like oh, I've see, got see those, uh, memes of people buying, buying the uh, buying stuff for Halloween in like in like February. Yeah. You? Oh yeah. Is yeah. I mean, if I see something Halloweeny and I want it, like I get it. And I mean, like my doormat says, "Witch, please." Um, <laughs> I have like a little bone collection that stays out on display year round. Um, a bunch of like creepy. Um, I went to Salem um, a couple of years ago, like right before the lockdown and um got like a whole bunch of like scrolls that they sell you know like in little gift shops or whatever um with different spells on them so like yeah my house is decorated and ready for halloween i don't really have to do a whole lot um when halloween comes around because it's pretty much already the, done did you get one of the 12 foot home depot skeletons that you <laughs> No, I did not get a 12 foot one. I have about a three foot tall skeleton. Um, his name is Wish, Wishbone. Um, <laughs> and he, he's, he's, me. <laughs> he's, he sits in the corner in the living room. So he, he's, um, he's a part of the family. Um, so when, when the time of year actually comes around, uh, so do you have uh, the streets in, in, especially even in Texas, are they like thronged? With pe with kids and people going out and either ha yeah. Halloween parties or doing the trick or treating thing. Oh yeah, yeah. Halloween night is you know if you're driving anywhere that's in like a neighborhood, you have to be very careful because there's kids everywhere. Crikey, you just don't of, get that here. It, like, yeah, that's so, so weird to me. Like I've heard about that a few years ago. You guys don't really celebrate Halloween there, and I'm like, why? It's like candy, and you get to be anything you want. Like that's the best holiday. Why would you not want to do that? It does sound fun, and like I, I enjoy going to Halloween parties and that kind of thing. But the the only time that I ever trick or treated as as a child was in was in the northeast of England, which is an even weirder place. To I would I would have thought even further sort of distance from American culture, you would have thought in um, in Hull, in uh, Yorkshire. Um, and they and they had, there were a couple of streets in the sort of suburbs that actually took it seriously, and I don't know whether there was. Perhaps a high concentration of American families or something, but that it, I actually experienced a more, uh, you know, what you see in movies for like an American Halloween trick or treating there. And then when I moved to other places in the UK, it was just never replicated, and I never understood it as a kid. Um, but now I assume it's some kind of diaspora. But um, yeah, it, I, it doesn't really happen. 
I have a really strong memory of being a small child and I'm pretty sure the movie Hocus Pocus was not long out. Oh, that's a and bang. This was, like... <laughs> this was my first period of enjoying Hocus Pocus when I liked it because it had before a couple of years later when I liked it because of uh, Sarah Jessica Parker. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what a woman. What a witch. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I insisted, uh, you know, we have to go trick-or-treating, which first of all, I'm a type 1 diabetic. Trick-or-treating <laughs> is basically collecting stuff that I can't eat. That's, <laughs> that's all I was doing. We're just we, denying uh, other children sweets at that stage. We went and, you know, we knocked. Most people just didn't answer the door. But we went up to a massive great house. Absolutely stunning, beautiful house. And I remember this so clear. We knocked on the door. It was me, my little sister, and my mum sort of awkwardly stood behind us doing the English, I'm so sorry face. And um, the guy from the door he looked at us and went, oh, right, yes, Halloween. Got his wallet out of his pocket, pulled out two fibers, gave me and my sister one each, and went, That'll do, won't it? And then closed the door. <laughs> of course, my mother I mean... liberated the fibers. <laughs> <laughs> for a brief moment, you held a, an enormous sum of money for, for a very small child. Imagine what you could do with the penny sweets. Oh, well, not you personally, but. No, not me. <laughs> Our oh, business. <laughs> Sell them all at two p. Double your money, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, you guys should like bring Halloween back. Well, bring Halloween there, I guess, not bring it back. But yeah, yeah. Adults I mean, do it more. Adults do it more. It's more of an adult thing, I think, in the UK. Like I've yeah. been to a lot of Halloween parties, and people take it. People really go all out with the. The costumes and the music and the watching the films and everything, you know, decorating the house. And that's always a really good vibe. Um, yeah. I am a total neophyte when it comes to horror movies, though, because I just sort of didn't watch them when, when I was growing up. And a lot of them aren't seen as, like, good movies, I would say, in terms of... Yeah. They're not, like, works of art or whatever. So even <laughs> yeah. when I was a teenager and stuff, I wasn't watching these things because I was being more exposed to the other end of that uh, that sort of movie spectrum. So I haven't really started watching horror movies until well until my sort of like early 20s. Um so I'm still I'm still going for it. So do you have do you have like a, a set up, you know a set of Halloween go-to movies that you watch every year? Um I usually watch The Adams Family with my kid. You know, one of one of the ones from the 90s usually. Mm-hmm. Be values, um, mate. Be yeah <laughs> yeah that one's a really good one um so yeah we'll usually watch that um although he doesn't really watch it <laughs> you know he's it's weird like he doesn't sit through movies very oh. well um like it takes it has to be a really good movie to hold his interest he just gets bored and you know wants to go play video games or something but um i play the adams family but i also do um like twilight zone I'll watch Twilight Zone. Uh, of course. Every it's Halloween. Your, this is what's well, your it's your year round comfort viewing, isn't it? If, if, yeah. Uh, as we were talking about last time. Yeah, the, yeah, it is. Just the, is. Same. Just yeah. the same as every other. Thing. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just watch you know more episodes on Halloween usually, but yeah, like after he goes to bed, you know, we do trick or treating and all of that. Then yeah, I'll like find something new to watch on Shutter or Netflix and check out a new horror movie. Have you got to? Uh, a favourite horror movie, Nick? Probably Hellraiser 2, Hellbound. Go on, sell it to me. So, one and two are a pair, really, but it's... There are devices that, if you complete them, these puzzle boxes, they allow you to be opened up to greater levels of experience so there are fallen angel type things called cenobites whose entire job is based around just torturing people <laughs> and uh it's it's just really good visual horror really okay. cool special effects and it's really hard to sell horror movies on their plots <laughs> <laughs> But is it, is it the kind of thing that actually scares you? Or does it, you know, because I know a lot of horror movies, especially ones that people watch as a, you know, as a group or whatever, it's, it's, it's possibly because it's so cheesy. 
I'm you know, a... like you know, don't open that door, obviously, kind of vibe. Is it that those, kind of thing? Those movies don't really do anything for me. I'm a body horror guy. Right. You know, I'll watch uh, Hellraiser and I'll watch The Thing and anything that's got a bit of oh, that's crazy. Although, like, <laughs> if you're going to watch a new one this year, I, I think I've told you already to watch it, but watch Us. Oh, um, yeah, that's really um, good. Oh, God, I've forgotten. Um, the dude Jordan story. Peele. Jordan Peele. Fantastic. <laughs> I, I really liked Get Out. I thought that was fantastic. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure I'd like us. It, yes, I need to I need to get on that. Has his version um, of Candyman come out yet? I actually don't know. No, um, they delayed the release. I think it's supposed to come out in October now, but who knows if that's going to actually happen because... COVID. Oh, you, you need to say, Tonya, it just came out recently or possibly didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what yeah. any of you at home are thinking, it's not August. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, it was supposed to come out last October. Um, but they kind of canned it um, because theaters were closed and all of that. So yeah. it got pushed. To this October. Oh yeah, I uh, I think I need to I think I need to re-educate well educate myself full stop on uh, horror movies and watch some more because uh, a few of them that I've watched recently have been have been pretty fun um, and uh, I think it's always a good place to to start to get like to get into something as a, as a genre. I think movies are a good way to do it. There, there's uh, just so much so much horror you can try and something for everyone i really mean that <laughs> there's just like check out the the jeff goldblum version of the fly that would be a good one for you i think that one crosses up crosses over into like that classic territory as well doesn't it so that probably does sound like it'd be a good recommendation i'm actually interested to, interested to hear more about um salem uh tonya yeah was there yeah was was there anything um did you get a spooky vibe whilst you were there? No, not really. I mean, I was just like super excited to be there. So I don't know like if there had, I mean, I was there in February. Um, I did not go during October, but um, like I went. Get, do people get but, wild in, for, for Halloween in Salem? Yeah, apparently like it's a big thing. They actually um, shut down last year. Because of um, COVID, they were like, we're not letting people come here. Don't come here. Um, you know, we don't want you here. <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> um, you know, and of course, you know, people came anyway. But, um, you know, definitely much less than what I think you would normally see. And one year I would like to go around Halloween, but, you know, it hasn't worked out that way just yet. That actually sounds like a horror movie plot, doesn't it? Where a place says... We don't want you around here, and people. Right. Like, yeah, like, they come that, anyway. But it's it's slightly is it slightly less sexy when they're rather than getting chased around a field by a dude in a ma mask and a with a chainsaw, they're instead just getting real sort of respiratory difficulties. That, that's sort of it's not quite as uh, no <laughs> not like, horrifying an ending. What's the movie called, Ben? The Rebreather or something. <laughs> The Salem Trials, colon space rebreather. <laughs> COVID frieteen. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> that was terrible. Oh, I he's full of. I, I regretted that before I even finished saying <laughs> it. So. <laughs> oh dear. Well, I think we've had we've had some uh, good stories there, and I'm sure uh, everyone's going to really enjoy this uh, this coming weekend. It's definitely not August when we're recording this. <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> so, uh, so I think to uh, to everyone listening, uh, go out and uh, have a spooky time, but not in a Manson way. That that came out weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just realised, you know, where he's the you know like in um, Once Upon a Time in uh, Hollywood, where they like get witchy with it, get real yeah. spooky with it. Yeah, I didn't want to start doing the Manson vibe at right at the end of this. <laughs> Well, we're just gonna go and play night crawlers, and it'll be fine. <laughs> go on. I've got I'm one last emergency question, Tanya. Oh yeah. Yes. Candy corn, right? We don't have that here. Is it crunchy or chewy? 
It's chewy and it's gross. Be thankful you don't have it there. I've always wondered. Some people love it. Like they're like, don't slander candy corn, but those people have no taste on listening to them. <laughs> hmm. And it's yeah, it's chewy. It's cool. No, it doesn't taste like corn. I mean, it's like, it's not even really shaped like corn. I don't know why it's called candy corn. Um, but it's kind of chewy and it's basically just like flavorless sugar. It's like they just it's, it's like cool made corn, some cute. sugar in that shape. Mm. You know, like, if I want sugar, I'll eat pixie sticks. It's because Mama, Grandmama Huckleberry's three-color sugar triangles doesn't sound like <laughs> No. <laughs> candy corn. No, yeah, they gotta come up with a better name. But yeah, yeah, I, I don't think it's very good. My mom loves it. Like, she loves it every Halloween. She buys a big bag of it and eats it. And I just, I don't know how she does it. I don't know why she does it. Why she does it, yeah. Yeah, I wish, I wish she loved herself more, honestly. So. <laughs> it's always an interesting time is it when you're eating something and somebody locks eyes with you and says why don't you love yourself more <laughs> once you pop you can't stop like say it on the adverts yeah <laughs> yeah it's so, very much a divided thing though like i mean people get mad when you say candy corn's awful and then people get mad when you say candy corn's great it's it's a very divisive thing in our country Oh no! I mean, has the world had, had enough of divisive issues? At this yeah, point? especially like, here in America. Yeah. yeah, can people stop falling out over candied corn or whatever? Right. <laughs> Do you know what? I would rather argue with somebody about candy corn than you know something political. You had it here first. You know? <laughs> Tanya, where could people find you online to tell you that you have bad opinions about candy corn? <laughs> <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at mystifying, M-I-S-S-D-E-F-Y-I-N-G. I'm also on Instagram and TikTok as mystifying. You can find Nightlight Podcast at Nightlight Pod on Twitter or nightlightpod.com. I'm also on Instagram at Nightlight Pod. And uh, Nightlight Pod is where they can also just get way more horror uh, yes. from you and from, from others. Uh, yeah, support. yeah. Yeah, and um, podcasts, I mean, you can listen on pretty much any platform. I'm anywhere. All good podcasts are sold. Excellent. And are you doing a, uh, a Halloween episode yourself? Yes. Uh, every year I do a full cast audio drama Halloween special. This year it is going to be a reimagining of a classic tale. Ooh, definitely tuning in for that. Right, well, thank you so much for your time, Tonya, and, uh, and for your story. It's been lovely talking to you for the second time. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. See you again. Oh, we'll get you back again. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> More threats. More threats. Yes. yes, I would love to come back. Yeah, you just <laughs> let me know when. Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Tiny Bookcase. Remember to subscribe, otherwise you're going to miss out on the future fun. Also, tell a friend. If you like this episode, link them to it. We'd be tremendously grateful. You can follow us on Twitter at Bookcase Tiny, Facebook at The Tiny Bookcase, and Instagram at Bookcase Tiny for updates. Speaking of supporting the podcast, well, magic can only take one so far. The Tiny Bookcase is supported by the generosity of its patrons. Those kind souls have really kept my belly full the last year. Let's cast a spell for them, shall we? For a Magnificent Beardery, let's cast the Chinicus Folliculale spell on Gary Laird. For Rich Ginger Tones on the scalp, let us cast the Orangi Hedondo spell for Scott Byrne. And for General Fabulousness, why not the Ula La Alge Mother spell on Matthew McLaren? How do you come up with that shit, man?